have you here. Great. Well, thanks for offering to do this workshop for, for the B Court community and uh, people who have signed up to the BBA as well. Um, this is going to be very swift at all because we might be um, telling people how to suck eggs uh, if we talk about the B Court movement too much as we promoted this to our community. But I will do just a very swift um, whistle stop tour. Uh, and then introduce and hand over to introduce the, the BBA. And um, if we go to the next slide, fabulous. Um, many of you will be aware that the world has many, many problems and challenges. And I think at the root of it, if we really recognize it, if business hasn't caused, they've definitely perpetuated some of the world's challenges that we face today. And whether that's around the uh, concentration of power, um, the fact that people are often paid a minimum wage, that the um, business world is male dominated, or the fact that we're in a climate emergency um, on, on top of everything else that we face, whether it comes to kind of social inequality and racial injustice. Um, and what we want to do is harness the most powerful man-made force on the planet, that is business, um, to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And so um, if we move on to the next slide, um, the B Corp movement is about trying to recognise that the system that we work in at the moment is broken, uh, that capitalism is broken. It's it's doing OK capitalism, but it just has the wrong operating model. And that's what we want to change. And we recognise that one of the biggest issues that we face and the reason why businesses have perpetuated some of the world's biggest challenges is because they have placed shareholder profits above all else. And what we want to do is rebalance that out. We want to recognize that actually people and planet are just important as um, returning profits to shareholders. It's including stakeholder governance into the way that we um, operate. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're on a mission to transform the role of business into society. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, so the B Corp movement is trying to do this in, in, in kind of three broad different ways. So one, we ask businesses to um, take the B impact assessment. They answer questions in five different areas from governance, workers, environment, community, and customers. Um, and we uh, ask them to meet a minimum requirement. We ask them to get 80 out of at least um, 200. And that 200 is slightly flexible for many different reasons. Um, and we also ask them to do one other thing, which is fundamental. And this is kind of at the root of what we're talking about when we're thinking about governance and we're talking about um, rigor and regulation. And that's looking at mission lock. So we want um, directors to recognize that the purpose of a business is to have a material positive impact on people and planet and we also ask them to report on that impact every year um, we need them to consider stakeholder decisions um, say to hit stakeholder interests when making decisions um, and so that's what the mission lock is we ask every business to amend their articles of association and um, and insert that into them uh, and the BBA is a nice follow-on from that and so hopefully that's teed you up nicely um, and we've done that just to, just to reiterate the, the mission lock situation is that something that has happened all over the world. So we recognize that shareholder primacy, which is what we're trying to tackle, has reigned supreme in the US for many, many years. And so we've changed um, legislation in 35 states, but we've also done it all over the world. So um, whether that's in France and Italy or whether that's in Rwanda or Colombia, um, and there are many other countries as well that we've tried to create change. Um, but we recognise that creating a really lovely, brilliant community of businesses who have changed their articles of association and have met really high standards isn't enough. We need to create change and, and change legislation. We need to mobilise this and we need to create a movement. And that's what we're trying to do by bringing this community together, by launching things like the BBA. Um, we're trying to create change because we're trying to change the economic system. Um, and on the next slide. Uh, so what does that look like? We have 4,000 B Corps across the world. This isn't just about one section or one industry. This is about 150. Um, and this isn't just about something that's led from um, the UK or the US where we started. Actually, it's in 74 countries across the world, which is pretty exciting. The combined revenues of the B Corp movement is 88 billion. And we have one unifying goal, which is to use business as a force for good. Um, and if we go on to probably, I think, my final slide. Yes, uh, this is one of my favorite documents that we ask every single B Corp who certifies um, to, to sign. And it's our declaration of interdependence because if we think about the world's biggest challenges, 
that we face, we can't separate one from the other. Um, and if we think about racial justice and the climate crisis, we need to recognize we need climate justice. Um, and they are so intertwined. And at the root of this document, this declaration of interdependence, is that recognition that actually we can't work in silos and we need to understand that we need to look after each other and each generation and look after that for the, for the purpose um, of, of all of us, right? Because we all want to be around in the future. And we also want to recognize that for our children or our friends' children um, to create that change. And so we need to um, work together. Hence the reason why we're working with the Chance Lane project uh, <laughs> to do that. Um, and so I think that's my final slide. But what I will just, oh no, it isn't my final slide. Okay, I lied, apologies. Um, the B Corp Climate Collective is something that we launched um, just ahead of COP25, recognising that we need businesses to take big, bold, ambitious climate action. We asked many businesses to create a net zero commitment, um, and we've got 1,000 businesses who have done that, um, which is great. But we also recognise a really interesting challenge that is rooted in um, what you could do if you were creating a net zero commitment and what you need to do. And that need to do is needs to be based on reduction. And we need to engage businesses as much as possible just to understand what their emissions are, but also to reduce and then to remove. And then we can talk about um, the other ways of getting to net. Um, the other couple of things that we've done with the B Corp Climate Collective is also looking at um, uh, encouraging businesses to declare a climate emergency um, and also uh, recognizing climate justice. So we're doing a playbook um, to, to encourage people to think about climate justice. Um, and that is, I think, my final slide. If I say that again, that'd be really awkward. There we go, phew, okay. Over to you, Mari. Thanks, Kate. So um, yeah, as Kate said, I'll talk about the, the Better Business Act, which is a campaign um, with, uh, be the, with Be Lab UK as its secretariat. So kind of coming out of that, um, that part of the, the kind of Be Lab journey that Kate was talking around about mission lock. So um, next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. So really, um, the, the mission of the Better Business Act is to, to change the UK law to make sure that every single company in the UK, whether it's a big company, or small company, aligns the interests of their shareholders with those of wider society and environment. So really looking across those kind of three areas and making sure that um, they have equal weighting or they're kind of sort of in a, the director's hands to, to balance those weightings as opposed to always putting um, shareholder primacy shareholder privacy first. So um, our objective is specifically to amend section 172 of the Companies Act in line with these principles. So really kind of having that, um, that mission log instead of it being something that um, companies voluntarily go into, it sets as the default for all businesses in the UK. Next, please. Thank you. So um, we've got a lot, lot of evidence around kind of this um, particular area of work and um, kind of telling us that now is really the time to act on this. So um, around about kind of 72% of the, the UK public think businesses should have a legal responsibility to the planet and people alongside maximum uh, maximizing profit and the kind of the, the majority um, favor brands that do do good in the world so I think again like to this preaching to the choir type point like I think many of you will will know that um and two-thirds of two-thirds of respondents felt like business has a sort of role to play in filling some of the government's gaps around society and then 60 percent of directors um are re recently surveyed by the institute of directors have felt that this is a change that they feel they want to make to give them real kind of empowerment over how they how they have those conversations in the boardroom um and make sure they're not held to that shareholder to primacy um next please Thank you. So um, we have a kind of draft articles of the Act and the legislative change that we want to see, but we um, are quite aware that potentially sort of a specific wording of this won't maybe get to into the Queen's speech. So we're really about kind of four key principles and trying to put those four key principles and um, get those kind of through into the into the Queen's speech in May um, or around May. So our objective is really to see these four principles amended in the in the Act. So the the kind of key one around aligned interests so looking at the aligning shareholder interests with those of wider society of the environment empowering directors so making sure directors are able to kind of feel free to to really have that um 
that direction in the boardroom so they're not um, limited by that shareholder primacy. Um, and then the making it the default is really what's key. So instead of um, a lot of kind of great businesses thinking like this is something that we we really want to do, actually just having it as the baseline so that um, so that everybody that's the starting point and really that everybody kind of grows from there. And then for bigger businesses, looking at this kind of point about reflecting and reporting. So looking at how um, how we really kind of hold businesses to account for that. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so at the moment, um, the campaign launched in April this year, um, and we have a, um, just over, actually now over 870 supporter organisations who have signed up to the Better Business Act. Um, and this kind of ranges from lots of small and medium-sized enterprises to sort of bigger household names that you can see on the slide. Um, and we're really looking to grow this coalition into the kind of beginning of next year and aiming to grow this to a, a, a thousand co um, coalition supporters and more ahead of the the kind of big campaign surge at the beginning of next year which is going to be ahead of the, the kind of May Queen speech target that we have um, and really our kind of I guess our theory of change is around using businesses to to really lobby their MPs to, about what they want in this particular area to make sure that kind of we get the political support around something like this as well so I think if there was kind of one particular ask to um, to the a group of businesses it would be to kind of have a look on the website see if that's something that you feel aligns with your values and if you if it does sort of sign up for the coalition and that's that's me so yeah thank you ever so much um at the chancery lane project we are really excited to be working with um b labs and better business act i think there's just so much the work that we can do together and as uh, as kate said that you know this is really an ecosystem of organizations um I am Becky Anderson. Um, I am a former commercial contracts lawyer. I used to specialise in outsourcing. Um, I'm now the Director of Engagement at TCLP um, and I'm joined here along with B Labs and Better Business Act um, by my colleagues from TCLP, Jenny Ramos, Josh van den Dries, Chirag Rao and Leonie Brabant will be helping the, to uh, run this session for you. Um, very, very quickly, I will say that this is a workshop, but we won't be going into breakout rooms. Um, we're going to be staying in this room. We're going to be doing an online exercise together. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. My colleagues will either answer them straight away or we'll save them up and answer them at the end. Um, and because we're going to be doing a little online exercise together, before I get into the meat of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Jenny, who's going to do a very quick tech walkthrough of the mural board for you all. Thanks, Becky. Um, so I'm hoping that you can now all see the mural board on my screen share. And so you can zoom in and out using the bottom right slider at, at the bottom here. Um, zoom of 10 or 11% seems optimal for most screens. And then you need to click on the little hand button just next to that slider. I don't know if you can see me circling it here. And a message will pop up saying editing enabled. Um, and that will let you edit the stickies and join in. So it shouldn't be you're in move mode, it should be editing enabled. So as Becky describes the clauses, um, we'll all drag and drop sticky notes from their piles here on the right over to where you think that they should sit on the graph, depending on whether you think they'll be easy or difficult to implement or have a high or low climate impact. And just lastly, if you make a mistake, that is no problem. You can easily undo it by pressing Control plus Z. So back over to Becky. And Becky, I'm just going to get the slides back up for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So there's going to be a section later on. We're not going to do it right straight away. There'll be a section later on. We'll be going to ask you to log into this mural board. <clears throat> so there's a link in the chat and we'll put the link in again when it's time um, and then I will take you through the exercise and you can drag and drop the stickies at the same time but don't worry that was just a kind of a, a preamble and we will talk you through um, the actual clauses in a second but from now on I'm going to talk um, about the opportunity. So the aim of this workshop is talking about the opportunity that we have to use contracts to, de to deliver climate goals. Um, throughout the course of this workshop, we're hopefully going to build you up a practical toolkit to help you use our clauses, because that's what TCLP do, does. We publish resources for free, climate-related contract clauses and other resources, um, and this is a workshop about helping you to use those clauses in your day jobs. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to be talking through clauses 
which may have been adopted by your clients and which might end up in a tender contract that you're going to be asked to sign at some point so that you can see what they look like. And really, I think, have some really frank and open conversations about how we go about using these clauses and the, the, um, the challenges to using them and the challenges to you um, accepting them if you see them in a contract. Because unless I think we're really, really open about all of these things, then the, we're going to lose that that rootedness in practicality, which is so important. We're not going to talk about technical drafting. Um, we're just going to be thinking with our commercial hats on about how we can use contracts to get clauses into documents in the real world, what the obstacles for SMEs might be, and what tools and help you need to address those. And the answer might be, I need my customer to pay me more. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to say. Um, <clears throat> But this is also about normalising, addressing climate risks and opportunities through commercial negotiations and commercial contracts. So hopefully you're going to leave the workshop today with a better understanding of how to assist your business, or your clients or your suppliers to deliver net zero ambitions and climate ambitions through contracts. And I think that the key issue for SMEs is going to be the same ones that you face every day in your business. It's going to be resources, expertise, money, time to deliver. Um, and it's just going to be those things in relation to climate rather than anything else. Um, I'd, I'd imagine that there's going to be a problem for SMEs in particular that you could be caught between different clients asking for different sorts of climate related disclosures or reports or changes that they are asking you to comply with their net zero requirements, which are all based on slightly different systems, benchmarks, metrics, even definitions of net zero could all vary wildly from client to client. Um, and it could very well be on you to kind of navigate a path between those, um, uh, you know, anything from, you know, clients who are really asking you to greenwash to full Paris Agreement alignment and beyond. Um, and the clauses and materials we're going to look at today, um, they are ambitious. Uh, they may or may not be beyond where you currently are, but they are on that journey to a 1.5 degree world. And so one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we talk through this is <clears throat> sometimes if we present a clause to you that looks wildly impractical and wildly non-commercial, it may very well be because that is what a clause looks like when it's fully aligned with the Paris Agreement. And that's really interesting. And one of the conversations I think we need to have uh, in business and in general is how do we get from where we are to the, that full Paris alignment? And, and seeing what that looks like in a contract clause can be really interesting. Thank you. So today um, we're going to do the, like I said, we're going to look at our climate clauses and tools we're going to get to know our model clauses. We're going to do that deep dive exercise on that mural board. And then we're going to talk a little bit about action planning. So you can go away with an idea of one thing that you could do after this meeting um, or after this workshop to put some of this into practice. Um, it's going to be a pretty fast paced session because we've only got an hour, actually we've only got 39 minutes now. So please, as I said several times, put your thoughts in the chat, share your insights in the chat, put questions in the chat if or save them right till the end for a Q&A um, but there are a lot of people from TCLP, B Labs and BBA on the call today so if you put your question in the chat there's almost certainly somebody there who can answer it straight away. Similarly if you've got tech problems put them in the chat and somebody will pick that up. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to move on now to explaining who the Chancery Lane project are. We've already heard from B-Lab and the BBA. Who are we? We are a non-profit pro bono organisation. We bring together lawyers to draft, peer review, and then we publish the contract clauses and materials that they have drafted and peer reviewed. And we publish those for free on our website, which I think that someone will have dropped some links into now, um, so that there is a bank of clauses and um, materials that you can use to help you meet your net zero goals 
available for free. And we're philanthropically funded, which is why we're able to do that. Um, our community includes over a thousand volunteer lawyers and over 200 participating organizations. Um, and that includes every single one of the top 25 law firms in the UK. And that's important because we are asking people to draft things in advance of regulation and legislation. These contract clauses are very far beyond the curve of where legislation currently sits. So asking people to use things so far in advance of, the, of where the law is means that we want to give you the confidence that that is, that that is good, solid drafting, which is why we are so grateful to so many of our expert lawyers and industry experts who write and review the materials that we publish. <clears throat> Very quickly, we've got some core principles at TCLP um, that we, firstly, we are independent of any professional body or practice. We're politically neutral. Um, we are huge advocates and enablers of collaboration and cross-fertilization. Uh, climate crisis is a multidisciplinary problem and we need a multidisciplinary solution. Um, all of our clauses and content is free to use and free to adapt. In fact, we expect you to adapt it and amend it to your specific circumstances. It's completely open source for our community to use and amend as you need and see fit. And secondly, oh, sorry, lastly, fifthly, we try to foster a safe space for innovation. So the drafting is not attributable to individual lawyers or law firms because we, as I said before, we're asking people to draft at the bleeding edge of law. And in order to feel safe to innovate, lawyers often feel that doing that anonymously is, is, a, is a good thing. So at TCLP, we are motivated by the fact that postponing transformational climate action is obviously not an option. I think everybody on the call agrees that. We also think that everybody has a necessary part to play in the coming transformation. And SMEs, of course, make up a giant group of motivated people who are often going to be on the front line of delivering net zero. So our goal is to shift the dial in commercial negotiations and get climate conscious clauses and wording that seems ambitious become normal very fast. So the resources that we have published here, you can see some examples of them and, and they're all available on our website. Um, we have published over 100 clauses covering a wide range of industries and the life cycle of a deal and legal practice areas, everything from finance, um, corporate governance, supply chain, employment and beyond. Um, we are going to be continuing to publish new clauses and content for the remainder of the year and well into 2022. We also have a comprehensive glossary of terms. So if you have a lawyer who's trying to put together an agreement and they don't have a def definition of net zero, go onto our glossary. There's probably one already written for you. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned before, each clause published on our website has been through a very rigorous peer review process by industry experts and legal experts. And each clause has a detailed user guide which sits behind it, which explains to you how best to use it. This is all available on our website. <clears throat> This user guide will complain, contain details of the, the climate issue the clause is seeking to address, commercial environmental context, and any other useful notes for people who are going to be picking up that clause and using it. And that might be a lawyer um, or it, it might be who it, it ever in your, it, whoever in your organization looks after your contracting. So earlier this year, on the 1st of October, we launched our Net Zero Toolkit. That was an amazing culmination of over 40 collaborative drafting events in 2022, hugely ambitious piece of work. And the toolkit is all about helping you to use climate aligned clauses to reach your net zero targets. Why clauses, why contracts? Um, <clears throat> basically, legislation and regulation is wonderful and essential. And I definitely hope that the Better Business Act makes it into law and as soon as it can. But we think that legislation and regulation is also very slow. So whilst organizations are working really hard to get the law changed, we say contracts are familiar, they are legally enforceable through all the same contractual mechanisms that you will be familiar with, such as termination or service credits or penalties, all of those things. Um, and they are bespoke and they are fast. And we can use those tomorrow to start putting climate considerations right into the heart of our business dealings. So when we launched the Net Zero Toolkit, um, 
it was all about using climate aligned clauses specifically to reach net zero targets. Of course, there are some of our other clauses tackle things like biodiversity, and we're going to be expanding that, I expect, as time goes on. Um, but the net zero toolkit was very much um, launched around COP26 and jumping off the race to zero um, uh, movement. And what we wanted to say to people was, you've probably just made a commitment to net zero because there's been a huge push for it. Here are contract clauses and here are tools which can help you make that a reality. So what tools do we have and what do they do? Firstly, we have uh, what I think is probably the best tool of all, which is a 10 minute video, which I know sounds very short and it is, and it just explains the concept of net zero. And the reason I love this is because so many people still are not on the same page about climate crisis or about what net zero even is. So this is a 10 minute video to play to your internal team, to play it at a shareholder meeting, play it to your clients, play it at a contract kickoff meeting, play it to your suppliers. Anytime you need everybody in the room to be on the same page before a discussion about what net zero is, take 10 minutes out of the meeting to watch this video so everybody at least has the same starting point. This will give you an accurate um, framework of defined terms that you can use and give you the key issues to watch out for. Now, This process will then help you choose the right sort of climate clauses for your agreement. And we have everything from low ambition, light green clauses, such as Eddie's recital, which is just a recital you put in the background section of your contract, to, to high ambition, Paris aligned, what we would call dark green clauses, such as Owen's clause. And you'll hear me talk about clauses in terms of names. Eddie's recital, Owen's clause, and that's because they are named for children who are important in the lives of the people who drafted them. Our toolkit will also help you to plot out and strengthen your own net zero ambitions so that they align with the Paris Agreement goals. Our net zero resources break down into seven areas for you to map your business, your suppliers, your contracts, even your clients against to see the areas where you need the most support and help in levelling up. Those seven areas are scope, warming level. So scope is going to be that one, two, three, scope, one, two, three emissions, where are they coming from? Warming level is what warming level are you oriented at? If you took your current greenhouse gas emissions, the current trajectory of your organization, are you looking at a warming level of 1.5 degrees by 2050 in alignment with the Paris Agreement, or is it gonna be two degrees, three, four, or worse? It looks at timing. What is your path and pace for decarbonisation? Are you going to hit 1.5 degrees in 2050 or 2030, hopefully, or earlier? Um, or are you looking at a timing and a uh, path and a pace which is much, much longer? Are you looking at maybe hitting 1.5 degrees in 2070, which may well be too late? It looks at offsetting. I think the reason that offsetting has been put in there is so many people see it as a silver bullet to reaching net zero, a silver bullet to climate change, and it's obviously far more complicated than that. Um, what we have done is that we've put together a pack of resources, a paper and a paper for you on what good offsetting looks like, how you need to start with a hierarchy of mitigation, what are the Oxford principles for offsetting and how can you judge what you're doing against those? Um, are you looking at off, are you, do you have any sort of quality assurance process at all in the way that you purchase offsets or in the way that your clients may be asking you to purchase offsets on their behalf? Next, of course, is governance. I'm sure many people are going to be familiar with um, the importance of governance around any sort of initiative, but particularly climate. Um, this is going to be, do you have board and shareholder buy-in? Um, do you have a process for monitoring what you're doing? Do you have targets? How are you measuring what you're doing against those targets? The sixth area is just transition. Are you um, moving forward in a way which is taking carbon out, but is at the same time causing huge amounts of problems for vulnerable groups and societies? Or are you working towards a transition where everybody benefits? And one of the reasons that we put this in here, and when we talk about this, one of the things we talk about actually is SMEs. And we say to um, larger organizations who may well end up being clients of yours if they're not already, 
you need to be very, very careful when you're doing a just transition, that it's going to be very easy for huge organizations with lots of resources to comply with all of the big requirements that you are putting on them around climate. It may be harder for SMEs. So how can you make it fairer? How can you level that playing field as a contracting organization asking people for tender um, responses or for products or for similar? And lastly, the seventh area is lobbying. And I, uh, this is actually my favorite area, even though it's kind of quite niche and nerdy. Um, but what I want you to imagine is there's going to be organizations that you belong to, like B Corp, B Lab, Better Business Act, but there's also going to be trade associations that you belong to. Um, if you are an SME that employs professionals, then those professionals may belong to professional organizations. So for example, I'm a member of the Law Society as a lawyer. Um, one of the things that we ask people to look at and look at in that seventh area is you have these trade associations, you are members of these bodies, who are they lobbying and what are they lobbying for? Are they lobbying in accordance with the Paris Agreement or are you spending money being a member of an organisation which is aggressively lobbying against the Paris Agreement. And there's been some really high profile cases in the US of companies that have declared fantastic climate goals only to have them seriously undercut and their reputations seriously damaged when it came out that they were spending millions of dollars on trade associations and lobbying organisations that were lobbying in exactly the opposite direction. So where are you? Where are you spending your money and what are they doing with it, I think is important. So next, I just want to move on to the next slide, slide seven. Thanks, Jenny. Um, the question that we always get asked, and rightly so, is these clauses all sound lovely, Becky, but is anybody actually using them? And uh, the answer is yes, they are being used. We've got case studies on our website and, and hopefully Josh will be able to put a link into the case studies if he hasn't already. Um, and the, the two that I wanted to pick out here that I think are going to be most useful to you is the um, Salesforce case study and the Environment Agency case study. So Salesforce um, has been using TC an amended version of TCLP's clauses um, in its sustainability exhibit that as its supply chain contracts are coming up for renewal, all suppliers being asked to sign up to the new sustainability exhibit, um, which is based on our clauses. And the UK Environment Agency is also using um, amended versions of a number of our carbon reduction clauses and our circular economy clauses to drive their ambitious environmental car and carbon standards in line with their 2030 net zero commitment throughout their supply chains. Um, and the reason I think these two are useful is because what they have done in implementing them in their supply chains is, is a really, really good gold standard for how to go about doing it. If you go and say to somebody, um, here is the contract and buried away in the contract is a net zero clause, then the lawyers are gonna start saying, hang on a minute, where has this come from? How is this being priced? What are you gonna do with it? Um, and what Salesforce and the UK Environment Agency did and did really well was take their supply chains on a journey give them education and resources and be really, really clear about the expectations they were gonna have rather than just surprising them with um, climate obligations right at the end of the process. So if we can move on to the next slide, I'll go through this one really quickly. Um, this is just to give you an idea of the breadth of our clauses and it breaks our clauses down across the legal life cycle um, from corporate governance through due diligence, procurement and hopefully never getting to disputes. Um, but I just want to be clear that our clauses aren't static. We expect our clauses are going to be an inspiration, that they're going to be amended and made bespoke to your industry, your particular organisation, your needs. Um, lawyers need to get their legal minds around amending them in the same way that they do for everything else. Um, and now I'm going to talk us through four clauses. Um, that I think, I hope, are going to be most relevant to SMEs, um, either that, that you could be using or that are the sort of clauses you might be starting to see in contracts coming through from clients so that you're sort of forewarned and forearmed. So um, this is going to be using that mural board. So if you can all log in to the mural board now. And 
let everybody let anybody know in the chat if you're having problems with the mural board. Hopefully not. Um, if anybody is having problems, Jenny, then let me know and, uh, and I can slow down. I'm going to introduce each clause and I'm going to invite you to select a sticky note and drag it to the position on the graph that's most appropriate for the clause. The vertical axis is the level of climate and action. So that's high climate action means positive for the environment, removes or avoids carbon emissions. The horizontal axis is the feasibility or ease of use of the clause in your practice or organization or industry. If you thought a clause had high potential for reducing greenhouse gases, but might be a little difficult to use in practice without some work or detailed negotiations or lots of extra money, um, put the sticky note in the top right quadrant. After today, we're going to be sending out a pack of resources to you, um, including uh, a worksheet and the slides and all of that sort of thing. So you're going to have plenty of time to dig back into these and replicate these sorts of um, uh, ex examples in your own teams, if that would be helpful. So if everybody's ready, we're going to move on to the first clause. This is Ava's clause. It's a green shareholder agreement for SMEs. So what's this clause? This is a clause with amendments to the standard early stage shareholders agreement for SMEs, which enable investors to hold an SME to account on climate change issues. And it aligns all parties' interests on achieving net zero. It's a short form version of another clause if you want to look at a longer version of it, but it enables shareholders to embed alignment with Paris Agreement goals at the highest levels of an organization and then prioritize Paris Agreement goals over short-term fast growth to deliver better performance and longer term value. So it gives you the confidence, I think, that the uh, shareholders' rights and future values is completely aligned to environmental outcomes. Um, and it allows you, companies and directors, to put climate goals at the front of your strategy, knowing that your shareholders are absolutely behind you on that. Um, interestingly, I think it also encourages investors into the business, whether individuals or institutions, to monitor and incentivize achievement of climate goals because it's directly linked to the value of their shares. Um, it also requires shareholders to contribute to the cost of offsetting residual emissions in proportion to their shareholding, um, which I think makes shareholders really and truly invested in getting to net zero. So one of the things that I love about this clause is that I think that we have a perception in the world of business that shareholders just sit there, um, they, you have to make them happy and give them lots of money, but otherwise they're kind of very much hands off unless they think that they're going to be getting less profit. Then this is much more about saying we're in part true partnership together that prioritizes the environment. Jenny, do you want to tell me when um, everybody's finished moving uh, the sticky notes for Ava's clause? And We've then got quite a lot of activities still, but if you haven't placed your sticky yet, please <coughs> do. Um, if you, I don't think you can see it, Becky, but they're mostly in the top right hand quadrants with some of them around the middle area. The middle uh, line. I'll be asking you about that later, but I've got some suspicions as to why. We've got about 10 placed so far. Wonderful. Some, some are on top of the others, I'm not sure. I've just noticed the time and so I'm going to crack on. I'm going to move on to Lila's clause. This is a board paper implementing net zero for SMEs. So it's a board paper for building net zero objectives and targets into your corporate strategy and then ongoing monitoring and evaluation of your progress against those net zero targets. It goes back to what I said earlier, those seven areas of net zero, one of which being corporate governance. Um, this board paper provides you with a framework for building out what your objectives and targets are going to be. Um, and it also encourages SME uh, directors to consider how to present the company's environmental values, targets and objectives to your stakeholders and sets out the benefits to you of doing so. Um, I think that one of the things that's great about this is it just provides a really simple framework for a board discussion, um, encouraging boards to understand your company's environmental footprint and identify the actions you can easily take to hit net zero. It starts that conversation going, gets everybody on the same page. Um, one of the things that I think is actually brilliant
brilliant about this, is it the paper itself includes a really clear and concise explanation of what net zero is for the board, so getting everybody educated to the same level, and links you to loads of helpful resources which are aimed at SMEs, gives you a checklist of risks, a checklist of other climate related issues for you to review. So even if you can't use this to implement net zero, I'd suggest reading it because it's just a really valuable resource in its own right. So this is a slightly different one in the sense that you might not want to use the board paper in a board meeting, but there's so many great resources in it. It's uh, have a look at it because it might be something useful to you. And if you can just drag and drop that um, into drag and drop the sticky for Lila's clause, then that would be amazing. People having done it already, Becky, oh. I think you can probably move on. I think to I'll, else I'll crack on. If you move us on to Raphael's DDQ. So this is very simply a supplier due diligence questionnaire, which you can either use with your supply chains or there might be questions in here that you're going to see coming down to you um, from organizations who have already adopted it. And this is really about setting expectations inside that procurement process itself about making sure that you are aligned culturally around the issues of net zero and environment um, with your the supply chain that you're building and making sure that they have a baseline understanding um, of what net zero is what is required and where they are on the journey one of the things that i say again kind of going back to that just transition point when this is being used by larger companies is i say this is not necessarily a stick to beat someone with to say well we're not going to bring you on board uh, we're not going to um, engage you in our supply chain because you've answered so poorly to these questions. But what I say to large corporations is look at suppliers who rate well in other areas and poorly on this um, that on their climate change stuff under Raphael's DDQ, because what that might be is a signal to you where you could intervene and help a supplier with education, with resources, with upskilling um, in a way which doesn't necessarily cost lots of money, but which will help a small medium enterprise be able to compete on a level playing field with the likes of a Tesco's or a Sainsbury's or somebody like that. Um, so really, it's a series of questions, again, a series of tools, which just teases out the most important questions that you need to be asking to make sure everybody is aligned with Paris and net zero. Tell me when everybody's done with that and I'll move on to the last clause. Many, yeah, so if you, those of you who haven't done it yet, Please do now. Okay, let's go on to Owen's clause. This is probably the dark, one of the darkest green clauses we have, and I fully expect most of you to feel quite worried about um, the implementation of this, and that's absolutely fine. This is a fully Paris aligned best in class clause. This is a sort of thing that um, a contract which is aligned with 1.5 degree by 2050 world contract would look like. And it's pretty tough. So um, this is a clause about cascading net zero targets down a supply chain, um, both in terms of checking if your supplier has a net zero target and if it does, whether it's aligned with your own, um, but also setting a carbon target for the specific agreement that you're working with, where that carbon target is going to be reducing year on year. And if the supplier doesn't meet that carbon target, then there will be penalties to be spent on offsetting the amount by which they miss the target and potentially even termination. So this is a very, very full on dark green Paris aligned clause. Um, and it's very, very powerful, but slightly blunt tool, I suppose, in forcing your supply chain to align with you. You may want to use it with your suppliers. However, part of the reason I put it in here is that variations of Owen's clause are making their way into agreements which you might see coming down the chain um, and really having a think about. I suppose the question that I would always ask from when I was an outsourcing lawyer is how much would it cost us to comply with this? And is that something that I can add to the price or is that gonna knock us out of the running? And can we have a really open and frank and honest conversation about that? So 
I'm just going to wait until everybody has moved um, the sticky for Owens clause. And then we'll hopefully have a really good conversation um, about the clauses and where is it, where everybody has put them. Um, I'm very, thank you very much for sharing um, the mural board. So hopefully everybody can see the mural board, even if you weren't able to contribute for technical reasons. Um, I'm now gonna open it up. I'm gonna start asking some questions and I would love it if the people who have been dragging and dropping those sticky notes, um, I would love it if the people who've been dragging and dropping the sticky notes um, could tell me why they've put the clauses where they've put them and, and let's have a discussion. And if you think the clauses are totally unworkable and impractical, then I want to hear that because we're not going to make these clauses better by pretending they're perfect. So um, I think I would like to start with Ava's clause, that green shareholders agreement. So there's a lot of that in the high impact, hard to implement section. I think I know why it's there but I really want to hear from you. Is there somebody who put Ava's clause in hard to implement who would be willing to tell me why? Put it in the chat if you don't wanna, if you don't want to be recorded um, or just go off mute and shout it out. Maybe I will say why I think it would be very hard to implement. And then you can tell me if you think I'm right. Um, I think that the, the thing about Ava's clause is it's creating a relationship and changing the relationship between shareholders and businesses, which don't, doesn't currently exist. There's a huge culture change there in saying particularly things like to a shareholder. And I don't I have no idea how an SME would approach a shareholder and say, anything that we can't offset you will pay some, anything that we can't get rid of any emissions we can't get rid of we're going to offset and you're going to prepare a proportion of that based on your shareholding i love the idea of it but culturally i think that we're very far away from being able to make that demand on shareholders but i do think it would be better if we could i think it would tie in actually really well with some of the things you were saying kate i don't know what you think about that I was going to say, if there is a community um, out there who can engage their shareholders in this kind of topic, I have a funny feeling. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the B Corp community and the BBA. So, um, yeah, I feel like I feel like this should be a good starting point. Um, and it makes your shareholders understand who you are as a business and what your priorities are. Um, and we've encouraged, of course, many, many businesses to make net zero 2030. So probably actually uh, ahead of what 1.5 might be in re in practice. but. Um, yeah, I think it's a good starting point. Brilliant. I'm going to skip over Lila's clause because I think in some ways um, it's quite obvious why that's good to do and why that's easy to do because it's almost just like a self audit and education of your own internal people. And I think that we've got a very motivated group of people on this call. Um, and for you, um, that's it's not a hard sell for you. It's just a here is a really good resource. Um, I see that there's a lot of people putting uh, Raphael's DDQ sort of right along that middle line of uh, between everything, really. Is there somebody who wants to talk about why they put where they put Raphael's DDQ and why they put it there? I think there's two things interestingly that go go on with Raphael's DDQ, which make it um, hard. I see a fantastic comment from Naomi uh, aligns well with our current approach of asking to suppliers to complete questionnaires encourages positive behaviour. I think that's that's right. The easy thing about this is you're just asking somebody some questions, um, and you probably need to be prepared for the fact that some of the answers might come back with an I don't know. I think that we should embrace that because it means that we know where the gaps are. We know where the gaps are in our suppliers' knowledge, um, which is really important. But I think that one of the downsides of this clause, which we have been alerted to in the past, is that particularly for SMEs, you may not be tracking some of these measures. You may not have the resources to track some of these measures. And so it is easy for the likes of a very, very large corporation to reply because they've got a very sophisticated machine behind them. And if they can't comply, then there's a very legitimate question to be asked as to why they can't comply when they have so many resources available. Um, but one of the things that's been pointed out, particularly by public sector, is 
um, that SMEs may really struggle to answer some of those questions. Probably not anybody in this call because you're very sophisticated. Will Kirk says, it puts the onus on the supplier. We track it already, but great if we can move it on to suppliers. And I think that's right. And a large part of what um, Raphael's DDQ is really kind of aiming at is teasing out some of that scope three information, which is so hard and so slippery for so many people. And so if you wanted a list of questions to ask your suppliers to help you dig in to scope three, then that's just laid out for you in Raphael's DDQ. So please do have a look at it. Um, so where are we on time? It's, I, we've got to talk about Owen's clause. Everybody has put it right up in the corner of high impact. Absolutely. Really hard to get into use. Absolutely. Completely agree. It is deliberately ambitious because we want to give people something to aim for. Um, does anybody want to talk about why they've put Owen's clause where, where they've put it? Owens clause, just for just to remind you, it's that net zero target cas supply chain cascade. Any comments on Owens clause? One thing I think I would recommend everybody do is to read Owens clause. Um, I think everybody's right. Um, are the clauses available in Excel sheets so you can slot in your own note, notes in a column alongside? Um, I don't think they are, but I'm going to hand that question over to Jenny, who's our head of content. They are downloadable in various forms, but I don't think that Josh will correct me if I'm wrong because he's the website person, but I don't think they're available in an Excel spreadsheet. But we have we we are thinking very hard at the moment about how how we do things going forward as we expand and how we update and maintain the clauses and take on people's comments about their commerciality so we will take that comment on board and have a think about it to see whether there's something we could do to to enable that kind of feedback mechanism yeah great question thanks jennifer um i think that i'm just going to throw the floor open is there any questions at this point generally before I move on to wrapping up. Any questions about anything I've said or um, anything else? Oh, I see that Le Oni has just um, posted a really useful link um, to uh, an index available in practical law. Um, Leonie, do you know if you need a subscription to practical law to be able to use that? Or is I don't it think so. I think okay. anyone can just log in for that one. Brilliant. The clause names though, rather than the clauses themselves, because I think that the question was actually the clause, the body of the clause, if I if I understood it rightly. But maybe I misunderstood that. Is it a list of the clause names or is it the actual text of the clauses themselves? Uh, no, it doesn't include the text. It's the um, just a name and a description. Fantastic. Is there any more questions or shall I um, move on to wrapping up? Last call. All right. Jenny, do you want to move on to the, the last slides? Um, so thank you very much for coming, everybody. We are really, really keen that the, we are the enablers of practical action. Um, so there are so many different ways that you can start using our model clauses. And as you've seen from the clauses that we chose to show you, clauses in some ways is actually not a very good way of describing them because some of them are clauses you would absolutely put in a contract that you sign. And some of the documents that we have are due diligence questionnaires or board papers that um, and videos that help you educate your supply chain or your own directors if necessary. Um, so actually, I would say have a really good look at our clauses and our resources because there's an awful lot more there than just clauses that you would put in a supply chain contract. Um, so we are really keen that people get involved and start taking action. And there's a huge amount you can do to um, fight the climate crisis using business, as you all know on this call, because we've got a very engaged constituency of people here today. Um, but have climate conversations with your colleagues and clients. Um, find a buddy. Uh, to help keep you accountable, but also to help you when you've got questions, you know, if you have a, a supplier who's really struggling, then maybe you've got a buddy who you can say, what are the ways that you supported your other supplier through that carbon problem that you had? And can I apply that learning here for me? Um, 
please use our climate clauses. And even if you take them and adapt them, which we completely expect you to do, we would love it if you came back and told us about it so that we could do a case study on it, because we find that case studies draw out so many vital and practical um, examples of things that you can do um, outside of the wording of the clauses. You know, we are an organisation mostly made up of lawyers who have drafted and promoted the wording that you might use in these clauses, but there's going to be so many practical things that you do to implement them, like the way that Salesforce and the Environment Agency did a period of consultation and education. Um, things that are, make our clauses really sing and really work. So um, you can uh, turn up to some of the events that we have and maybe Josh can drop a link to our events tab. We're going to be having some onboarding events um, over the course of next month or two and we're, we're doing one-to-one -one clinics if you've got a particular problem and you want to ask us what clauses we might have in stock that can help you with that um, and lastly sign up to our newsletter we haven't yet decided our events program for 2022 but when we do the people on the newsletter are going to be the first ones to know about it so the last thing that I would suggest is I would love it if people have got something today, uh, something out of today that they weren't expecting, or if they've got an idea for an action they want to take. If you want to put that down in the um, chat channel about what it is that you might want to do going forwards, going away from this call, um, uh, or one thing that you learned today that was particularly useful or helpful to you, or any challenges you've got for me about what we've got wrong and could do better, I want to hit all of it. So. Otherwise, I would say thank you so much to my team for coming and supporting me today. And thank you, hugely thank you um, to Kate Sandal, um, Catherine and Murray from B Lab and the Better Business Act, um, who've been absolutely amazing. Thanks.